my whole career was in that world. That's all I did for 10 years. One of the big reasons I got out of my big practice was, and I mean, for 10 years straight, I was cranking you guys. I was seeing a lot of patients a week and I was very busy and I was treating all pain all day. And I had to get out of there because after a while it takes its toll on you. And as someone who lives with chronic pain myself, you know, it just got really exhausting and the li the lines start blurring. And so I just wanted to get out of the clinic and I wanted to get away from pain. But trust me when I tell you, I know there are people out there that are better pain experts than I am, but you're going to be hard spent to find one. I really understand how pain works and I have studied it because it's personal and it's personal amongst some of my family members as well. And I, my whole family has pain. I've really spent a lot of time looking at what could be helpful. And I have access to all kinds of cool stuff that you guys can't get access to. And I've tried everything and it works for a while. Everything works for a while. So we'll see how these GLP ones last, but the actual mechanism of action on them and how they're working and all these different tissues that are part of osteoarthritis and joint pain and the inflammatory process is just so dang cool. Okay. So there's mechanisms on bone. It's protective to bone. It's protective to muscle. I've talked about muscle before. It does not tear down muscle. It does not make muscle waste. There is no impact on the muscle that's negative. What GLP ones do on muscle is actually protective and it induces muscle protein synthesis. So all that you're hearing from people is a, it's a lie. The muscle wasting that we're seeing is due to the, it's a secondary effect of a really low calorie diet. When people restrict calories and they don't eat or they eat very little and what they are eating is potentially not very high in protein. And then they're not protecting their muscle because they're not strength training. So it's a dosing issue. It's a management issue. And then it's a compliance issue on the patient's part. These peptides actually protect muscle and they protect bone and they play with bone in a way just kind of the kindergarten version, you've got osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So you've got cells that build bone and you've got cells that break down bone. And as we age, our osteoblasts start to peter out and they kind of go rogue. So they'll start building bone spurs and all kinds of crazy stuff. And then the osteoclasts sort of gain power and they start breaking down your bone. And that's where osteoporosis starts playing you know, a role. And that's where we start seeing the aging of bones. And GLP-1 impacts positively bone homeostasis. It impacts the homeostasis between these osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And that is so freaking cool. <laughs> it is so freaking cool. So it suggests they could play a role in both tissue, bone tissue destruction and renewal. But what we want is balance in there. We want homeostasis. We don't want one side winning, right? We don't want too much bone growth and we don't want too much bone degradation. And then there's positive impacts on adipose tissue and that's adipose tissue throughout your whole body. It actually helps white fat beige, if you will. So kind of returning to a browning, brown fat is the fat we had when we were babies and it helps you be more insulin sensitive and it helps you really just keep your metabolism in check in a positive way. White fat is what we get more of as we age and we fill up our fat cells. That's white fat cells. So that's pretty damn cool. And then it actually has been shown to impact the fat that is in the joint. So you can get fatty infiltration into the joints. You can get fatty infiltration into bones and you can get fatty infiltration into muscle. And that's really unhealthy. When that starts to happen, that is your fat has gone rogue and it is that is not a healthy process. So there is impacts in a positive way from GLP ones on that whole process and potentially slowing that down or reversing that. And I think that's really very cool too. And then the nerves pain is really interesting because pain's happening in your brain. I know we think it's happening in the area that hurts, but it's actually ultimately being signaled from the brain. And so if we can reduce central nervous system inflammation, if we can reduce the hyperactivation and polarization of the microglial cells, they get primed and they get pissy and they're very difficult to revert back. And it's, there's some discussion that GLP ones could actually make the microglial cells happier again, back to their happy form. So there's actually one study GLP one receptor is expressed in microglial cells of the dorsal vertebral horn and overexpressed in models of peripheral neuropathy. That means you're getting a lot of receptors looking for GLP one intrathecal injection of exenatide, which is an old, that's like the OG GLP-1, reduced the hypersensitivity by up to 90% in a month. This was in a 
a rodent study by up to 90% in a model of peripheral neuropathy without affecting acute nociceptive responses. That means nociceptive responses are your pain responses. We don't want to dull your, it's complicated. We don't want to turn off the nociceptive responses because then you don't know that you're hurting yourself, right? You need to know that you're hurting yourself, but to be able to turn it down and calm it down is, and turn off that pathologic hypersensitivity, that's money. And this is I mean, this is just mind blowing 90% up to 90%. In addition, exenatide caused the release of beta endorphin from the spinal cord. This anti-allodynic effect induced by GLP-1 could be blocked by the opioid receptor antagonist naloxone. So interesting. It's playing on our opioid receptors. It's having an impact further than what we understand. So that basically all, all that fancy jargon means pain relief. And that is a good thing. 